I pray that I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for your invitation, and I bring the friendly greetings from everyone at the cathedral on this uh, Mothering Sunday. It's great to be here, although when I saw my name on the advert for this series of sermons and saw all the excellent speakers you've got coming, I felt, I think, as Pontius Pilate must feel about the creed. Delighted to get a mention, slightly unsure as to what role I'm being asked to play. I'm here, of course, to talk about poetry and prayer. To my mind, two very inseparable subjects. But I do know that the word poetry is scary for a lot of people because it can have very bad memories of school, being bored or humiliated because you can't remember the poem or don't understand it. And then maybe later in life you've tried to come back to poetry in some way, but you don't know where to start. You nip into a bookshop, you take off uh, an anthology, you flick through it, it still doesn't make much sense. And actually you don't get many words for your money in a poetry book, there's a lot of space going on in those books, and you just put it back. There's even a word for all this, metrophobia, the fear of poetry. Not the fear of London transport, although that would be understandable, the fear of poetry. Or, if you are old enough to remember Blackadder, perhaps he gets nearer the truth when he says, Baldrick, I'd rather kiss a skunk than read your poetry. However, I remember the day I realised my life needed more poetry in it. I went to hear Wendy Cope when I was a curate in St John's Wood. And I went to hear Wendy Cope read her poems in a local school. And towards the end, she read a short poem called Names, which was about, she said, about her grandmother, and I was brought up by my grandmother. She's still alive at the age of 102. She FaceTimed me today, by the way, to make sure I hadn't forgotten I was coming to see you today. And Wendy Cope read this poem called Names about her grandmother, and as I say, I suddenly realized I needed more of this. Here's the poem. She was Eliza for a few weeks when she was a baby. Eliza Lily. Soon it changed to Lil. Later she was Miss Steward in the baker's shop. And then my love, my darling, mother. Widowed at 30, she went back to work as Mrs. Hand. Her daughter grew up, married and gave birth. Now she was Nana. Everybody calls me Nana, she would say to visitors. And so they did. Friends, tradesmen, the doctor. In the geriatric ward, they used the patient's Christian names. Lil, we said or Nana, but it wasn't in her file, and for those last bewildered weeks, she was Eliza once again. I listened to those few simple lines that capture the fragile life cycle of a woman that you are probably feeling tender towards after those just 107 words. Memo for preachers out there, you can do extraordinary things with just 107 words. You don't always need 107 points or even 107 minutes. 
I found I was crying listening to that poem. It, it touched me. Not all poems, of course, make you cry. But what became clear to me, I think, that day and since, is that when we're talking about poetry, we're talking about a soul language, a way of crafting words that distills our experience as human beings into what feels like something purer. This is, I think, what the Irish poet Michael Longley meant when he was asked, where do you get all your poems from? Where do they come from? And he simply said, if I knew where poems came from, I'd go and live there. A quick exercise. If I said to you now, here is the news, you would probably sit up and expect to hear, hopefully, the facts of the day that have occurred, maybe some commentary on them. And you tune in your ears to hear truth coming at you in that form. But instead of saying that, what if I said, once upon a time? You'd be equally, I think, expectant for truth, but you'd now know it's going to come at you differently. You'd be ready to receive it in a different form. You'd tune your ears in differently. You'd be expecting a story where meaning is communicated without summarising it. Now, when you walk through those doors or into any place of worship, how have you tuned your ears in? Have you got your newsroom ears on, your BBC ears? Have you walked into a Google temple? Or have you just walked into a poem? Have you walked into a space that is celebrating the fact that God is not the object of our knowledge? How could that ever be? God isn't the object of knowledge. God is the cause of our wonder. You see, to walk in with expectations of hearing one thing, but then hearing something completely different could be really frustrating. It might even mean you think the whole thing is implausible. And category errors like that cause a lot of trouble and misunderstanding. Certainly in a Christian service, you have walked into poetry in motion. What was the first thing we did? We stood and we sang a poem. We call it a hymn. And then we heard another poem, an ancient one. We called it a psalm. And then, of course, we heard a psalm. And I asked specifically for it to be read rather than to be sung, to remind us that, that Psalm 23 is a poem. And then we hear prayers full of images and metaphors and similes. We hear scripture in our services. And even our bodies do a little bit of poetry in motion. If you're a high church cleric or a charismatic singer, your arms go into the vocative. Your gesture, your movement becomes poetic. We are seeking a language to praise the mystery and reality of God. You see, when a human being falls in love, and indeed many of you may be in love, as I speak to you tonight, I can see one or two flushed faces out there. When we fall in love, we look for a language that will express what we feel, and we will go to every length to describe the loved one. The last thing you are when you're in love is a literalist. We all become poets as we scurry around trying to do justice to the reality of who we are, what we feel, what we want. We take language to the gym to do a workout, to get fitter for purpose. 
And if poetry is the language of the lover, the language of love, then it must be the language of the church, the language of faith, as we scurry around trying to do some justice with our words to the truth of God, the truth of ourselves, trying, as Rowan Williams says, which is what he says theology is, trying to say the least silly thing we can about God. When you're in love, truth is far too important to be literalistic with. Now, in case you think this is all a little bit Radio 4, a little bit too I wandered lonely as a dean, let's just remember that all the ancient traditions of the great world faiths and the place of poetry has in the heart of each of those. Poetry is used all over the place when we need to get to the heart of things that matter. I've seen poets and poems being used in hospices as people end their life, at weddings when they express their love, in young offenders' detention centres, in children's classrooms, at national memorials after tragedies. We seek for words that distill. And right in the heart of our own Christian faith is the figure of Jesus, who was persistently figurative and poetic and parabolic. He would have scored in my theological college B- minus for his sermons because we're told quite often people would follow him and say, that, that was really nice, but what did it mean? They were all asking him. They were intrigued, but these parables hovered and never quite came into land. Jesus was poetic. The Good Samaritan never existed. The Prodigal Son never existed. There was no Lazarus at any gate. No woman ever lost a coin because Jesus made them all up. He was a verbal artist. He used similes and metaphors and parabolic riddles all the time. His stories, you see, were designed not to make easy sense, we're not into bumper sticker beliefs about God. He didn't want quick clarity. These were not there to make easy sense. They were there to make you, to remake you with a little bit of difficulty. Something to get into your status quo and wonder if you need to amend or change. And that's why poetry is not, at the end of the day, about information, it's about formation. We've all been given a great gift, it is our being. And we're asked to give one gift back to God for it. It's called our becoming, who we become. And we need a language that helps us form. Maybe for all this, the Christian creeds found it difficult to make succinct reference to Jesus' preaching. You couldn't paraphrase it easily. So we've just said the creed, where we heard Jesus was born, suffered, died and rose again. But there was something in between. He taught. And that poetry of his defies dogma. What we do know is when he finished his poems, his parables, his teaching, his preaching, he said something to people. He said, if you have the ears to hear, then hear. Might that be, have you tuned in right? Have you switched on your right ears here? Because this isn't the news. This is the good news. And language has gone into a state of emergency to help us get nearer to the kingdom. God loves us, I believe, just as we are. But God loves us so much. 
He doesn't want us to stay like that. And we need a language in our faith that's, as I say, not so much about information as formation. We need, and the teachings of Jesus are this, a language that doesn't set out just to answer questions, but to question answers. To distill us out of all this display and distraction that day-to-day -day life is demanding of us. Display and lots of distraction. We need a language that enlarges the heart, the mind, and the humane, and our understanding of the divine. This language of the poet spots your hard little full stops in life, little places we've closed down. It spots them and slowly turns them into a comma so that there is more of you, there is more possibility. It's time to stop being so prosaic. Just look at how George Herbert, 400 years ago in that sonnet, tried all those images, a sort of collage, overlapping images, just trying to describe prayer, ending with that greatest distillation of what it really is, something understood. Well, we are told by the American poet Wallace Stevens that we should like poems the same way children like the snow. When I was a small boy in Shropshire and I woke up and it had been snowing, I pulled back the curtains and there was the view I thought I knew completely gone. And I quickly dressed and I ran downstairs and the, the air was so cold I could see my breath and the path had disappeared and I had to create a new path. All these things are what poems are doing. They are reimagining your landscape. They are helping you see your own breath and being. And they're asking of you whether it's time to start a new path to forge a new one. I commend poems to you. In prayer, you might use them. I do every day. I try and read a new poem every day, spend 20 minutes with it, and use it to help me bring myself more consciously into the presence of God and to scrutinise myself, to catch up with parts of me that are submerged. There's something about a poem that's running up a hill, looking back at you and saying, catch me if you can. I use poems in my prayer that way. Some people pray by writing a poem. You can do it. You can do it. You don't have to show anybody. You can show the cat if it helps. But try it. Some new language that is within you might find an outlet. And what expressions of faith might you discover if you stop being so prosaic and get in touch with your inner life and landscape? God is in this world, said the Australian poet Les Murray. God is in this world as poetry is in the poem. And that means that the art of attention, greater attention to the world, to yourself, and to your soul, is important. We need a language for it. It's called poetry. The thing is, if you pay attention, I promise you, attention will pay you back. In poems, we discover. So pick up a poem this week and let it lift up your heart.